Well, good evening. It's good to uh, see you out back tonight, especially after you knew I was going to speak tonight. Uh, we appreciate you being here, and uh, we hope that uh, our time is beneficial together. What I want to talk about tonight is uh, fits right in with the theme of the day. Uh, as we talked a little bit about uh, a little bit this morning, that <clears throat> in Paul's message and uh, in our AM service, and then uh, some of the things that we talked a little bit about in our congregational meeting today. Uh, so what I have to say tonight fits right into that. But I wanted to start out by saying that, uh, as as by by way of introduction, uh, the truth of the matter is is that. Uh, the majority of this congregation doesn't have the perspective of how much this church has grown and changed over the past few years. And what I mean by that is I, I've been here now for be five years in September. And uh, I've seen it change dramatically uh, over the time that I've been here. Uh, when I moved here, there were uh, about 45 members or so, something along those lines, and uh, I, I reviewed our directory, our online uh, directory app, and I was looking at that as I was kind of preparing for what I wanted to say tonight, and I got to looking at that, and I counted about 37 people, if my math is right, somewhere in that ballpark, about 37 of our current membership uh, that uh, were here when I moved here. That's it. And at that time, there were no elders, there were no deacons, um, there were no technology stuff going on, there was no meetup groups, um, Bible studies, there were very few kids uh, in, in, our, in our, uh, our group. Uh, we sometimes struggled to find teachers uh, to fill the slots for teaching our Bible classes. Um, we were only at that particular time able to partially support our preacher uh, and things of that nature. But now, our membership, as I counted today, is somewhere around 130 in our directory. And most of this growth has taken place over the past uh, couple of years. And I want you to think about that for a minute. The majority of this group, the majority of our members, about two-thirds, if I'm doing the math right, uh, which I'm not very good at math, but somewhere in that ballpark, about two-thirds of our membership know nothing other than consistently having 100 people here for worship or more. The majority of our membership don't know anything other than having three elders and five deacons and uh, song leaders only able to lead singing every six weeks or so just because there's, we have so many that are willing and able to do that. The majority of our group don't know anything other than this, uh, don't know anything other than having the teaching schedule that's filled well in advance because we've got so many that are willing and able, uh, or, uh, or don't know anything other than being physically confined here a little bit as we talked a little bit this morning. You know, we have our men's class back here once a month, and we're packed in there like sardines in that classroom. Let me tell you. And we're to the point where now we're flowing out in the foyer. Uh, most people here don't know anything other than that. Uh, or, I mean, run the list. Uh, don't know anything other than supporting our, our preacher full time. Fully supporting him and partially supporting others in foreign countries. The majority of our group don't know anything other than having our, a, a, a YouTube channel for all of our sermon videos or the songs being projected on the screen that enhance our, our singing and enhance our worship or the social media accounts that allow us to, to reach thousands of people or hosting a successful vacation Bible school that we just did back a, a month or two ago or ladies Bible classes on a regular basis or the meetup Bible studies that take place uh, every week uh, with members of our community and the list goes on and on and on. Most people don't know anything other than that. And besides all of that that I just said, then we have the spiritual growth and development aspect of that. And hopefully that is evident to all. And if it's not, then just listen to the great comments in our Bible classes. 
Um, look at how many people have stepped up to teach our kids. And those who are not comfortable with doing it by themselves yet, but have agreed to team teach, to learn and develop. Think about all of that. Think about all of those souls who have been saved over the past couple years. Pat, Jackie, Isaiah, and maybe others that aren't coming to mind right now. Think about all of that. Folks, what I'm saying is, is that we are a blessed group of people here in Caseville. I believe the work is strong here. I, I believe that we're thriving. I believe good things are going on here. I believe that God and the Holy Spirit are at work through all of the members of this body of Christ here in Kaysville. But again, the majority of the membership don't know anything other than what I have just described to you. And so what I'm saying to you is that this growth, all these good things that we're talking about is relatively new to Kaysville. That hasn't always been the case. And a lot of this is in our very recent history. And so as I was thinking about what I wanted to say and what I've now just presented to you, and I offer this perspective to you, then I, three words come to mind as I think about that. And those three words are appreciate, build, and guard. That's what I want to talk about. And what I mean by that is we, we need to fully appreciate what we have. Let's be sure that we're constantly and consistently approaching our God with thanksgiving for his blessings here. And let's guard, again, guard what we have. Let's protect it. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. It's going to take diligence and, and, and alertness and awareness of everybody in this building. And we need to build upon what we have right now. Let's not get comfortable. As we've already talked about this morning, let's keep that momentum going as it was just even prayed about. Let's not get comfortable, but instead let's strive to grow and to build upon this solid foundation that exists. If you think about what I just said, one idea kind of stands out. There's kind of a common theme there. There's a, a common uh, idea through what I just said. Uh, with these three different points, and that is this. We need to guard against complacency. We need to guard against it. Let's be careful that we don't take all of this for granted. That's really at the heart of what I want to talk about tonight, and so if you will, be turning to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to spend all of our time in Ephesians chapter 4 tonight. The Apostle Paul... <clears throat> is writing some things here to the Ephesian brethren that I think are particularly applicable to us right now in the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. And I'll explain what I mean by that statement here towards the end of our lesson. But I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4 with me. In the first six verses of this chapter, Paul is emphasizing unity. All of us together form the body. And he implores them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ. What Paul is saying is, friends, is that we have a God-given purpose. We are called Christians, and we must live as Christians should. How is that? Well, notice what he says. He says, put on humility and gentleness and patience and showing tolerance for each other and loving each other and strive diligently to preserve this unity. Well, what unity are we talking about? We keep reading in those few verses, these four through six are verses that we're pretty familiar with, I believe. But look at what Paul says. There's one body. What does he mean by that? means there's unity in organization. means there's one church. That's what he means by unity. He says there's one spirit, which tells us that there's unity in revelation. There is one spirit who has revealed one revelation, not multiple conflicting revelations, as we might hear some say today. 
but one. Paul says there's one hope, which means there's a unity in desire and expectation for what is to come. There's one Lord, or uh, one Lord, there's, there's unity in authority. We all submit to the one and the only who holds all authority. Paul says there's one faith, which means there's one doctrine, there's one content of belief. There's one baptism. So there's unity in practice that puts us into that one body, into his church. And he finally says there's one God and Father. There is the only one, the only true God who has made all of these plans for man's redemption and who is worthy of our praise and worship. And so that's his focus in the first part of that. And he goes on in the next few verses with some more in individual application, which is where I want to focus our thoughts mostly tonight is in the following verses. Paul is going to explain how this unity is maintained in the body of Christ. What we need to understand is that unity is not going to come to the body by all of us being exactly the same. Unity doesn't exist in being the same person or having the same responsibilities or having the same functions in the body. That's not what he means. But instead, unity exists because the same one God, the same Father, the same Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, gave us these gifts. Notice what he says in verse 7. These are Christ's gifts. And so our differences will be highlighted and elevated so that the unity will exist to the glory of the Father. And that's what Paul's going to explain in verses 11 through 16. We'll focus on that in just a second. But Paul here in these verses quotes Psalm 68. He refers back to Psalm 68, and we won't go back and read all that, but he's using that psalm to explain that Jesus, in fact, descended from heaven to earth, and he conquered death, he conquered sin, he conquered Satan by dying on the cross and being buried and being raised from the dead. And then he ascended back from where he came from, ascended back to the throne of God, taking with him the, the spoils of his conquest, if you will. And so now he has the authority, because he has exalted back to the throne of God, he has the authority to give these gifts, to give these things to people, because he is the conqueror, and he has the right to distribute all of that. So in verses 11 through 16, he goes back to what he says in verse 7. Christ gave us these gifts, and he gave us these roles or these functions. And so we need to be careful that we're not going to get mixed up into thinking and understanding what these gifts are, first of all. Let's say that. Um, the, these were not necessarily all of these the, the spiritual gifts of the early church, but rather the idea here that, that Paul is getting at, the idea is, is that, uh, that he is giving us all different abilities and different roles and different functions within the body of Christ. And all of that in order to bring about unity and growth. He specifically names some of the functions there. Um, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You know, have apostles, those who are specially sent out. You have the prophets, those who uh, had, the, had the revelation. Uh, evangelists who were in charge of spreading this good news. Uh, the pastors are those that, that were shepherding the, the saved flock. Uh, and you have teachers who are, who are providing instruction, all of these different things that Paul is listing. And you may ask, well, why have a body of Christ with all of these different roles? And I don't think this is an exhaustive list, by the way. Uh, but why have that? Well, look at verse 12 through 13. Really, he lists four things. And Paul says, these things were given to people in the body of Christ so that the saints will be fully equipped in Christ. So that the body of Christ will be built up and that it will be strong. So that we can attain this unity of the faith that he was just talking about in the first few verses that he was emphasizing. And 
so that we can come to a full knowledge of the Son of God and we can become spiritually mature people. That's why. And why, you, you may find yourself asking sometimes, well, why, why is it important that we come together? Why, uh, why, why is it important, uh, why, why do we need this body? Why do we need this local body of believers here in Kaysville? Why, as Paul put it this morning, why do we need this family? Why? Well, it's because this is how Christ equips us. This is how he equips us and how that we grow the way that he intended for us to grow. And you may find yourself sometimes questioning your role. Well, what is my role? What is my function in this body? You may think sometimes you may have uh, thought, well, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't even know that I really have a role in this body. Um, you, you may feel that uh, just because that you don't do anything in the public worship service that, that you have nothing to offer. Maybe that's the way you think. And I would say this morning, or tonight rather, um, that couldn't be further from the truth. That couldn't be further from the truth. This passage is teaching us that everyone has something to offer. Everyone has something to contribute. No matter how small or how insignificant you might think that it is, we all have something to contribute. The purpose of all of these gifts or these roles or, uh, again, this, the, 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 all of these functions is to equip the saints. Why? Notice what he says. It's highlighted on the screen. For the work of service. The work of service. These gifts were given so that everyone, again, I'm emphasizing that for a reason, Everyone would be able to do works of serving in the kingdom and to build one another up. In no way, friends, in no way did Christ want only a small couple of people, group of people, to do all of the work. That is not what Christ intended. Christ gave us these gifts with a purpose that every person would do the work of serving and building each other up. Notice verse 12. I have it highlighted. It says, equipping of the saints for the work of service. Well, who are the saints? Who are the saints? Saints are you and I, saved believers. And so if the passage says there's equipping of the saints, well, that includes all of us, friends. And so I think something goes horribly wrong when the entire body is not doing the work of serving and building up as Paul is describing here in this passage. And unfortunately, there is sometimes an inverted way of thinking to where the responsibility falls on the preacher or the elders or the deacons or maybe a select few of people to, to do the work and the rest watch. That's happened. That happens sometimes. Not saying that it's happening here, but it happens. And so maybe you found yourself thinking this way. You know, well, hey, the, the Kaysville Church is, um, seems to be trucking along pretty well. Things are going really good, and I don't have to do a whole lot. Um, or maybe you think, well, I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll just, you know, I'll show up to, to a service uh, every now and then or uh, but don't really want to get my hands dirty and really dig in and engage or something along those lines. And I stand before you and admit to you that earlier in my life, that was me. That was me. So I know it exists because I was that, was, I was that guy. But this is absolutely, friends, not what Christ ordained. This is not what he intended for the body of Christ. What we need to realize is the importance of what Paul is saying right here. What he's really saying is, we need you. Paul is saying, we need you. We need all of you. He's saying the body needs every single member to function to its fullest potential so that we are as strong as God wants us to be and, and expects us to be. 
Let me make that, if you will, allow me to make that a little bit more personal, if you don't mind. Let me just say this. I need you. I need you. What I'm saying is, is I need your encouragement. What I'm telling all of you that are listening to me today or listening on the video whenever, if you're listening to it later on, what I'm telling you is I need you. I need your encouragement. I need you to hold me accountable. I need you to push me into serving like I should. I need you in my life so that I'm growing like I should. We need each other. We're a family. When we're not here at services or we're not participating in activities outside of services, if we're, we don't have close relationships with our brethren throughout the week, if we're uh, not actively involved in serving or looking for ways to serve, if we're, if we're not fulfilling our role and our function in whatever way that might be, what we need to understand is that the facts are this. The facts are, number one, we are being a discouragement to somebody. We just are. If we're not doing what we can, we're just being a discouragement to somebody. And we're not allowing ourselves to be encouraged by someone. We're not taking advantage of opportunities to grow and striving for the unity that's being described here in Ephesians chapter 4. In short, what's going on is, is that we are suppressing our God-given role and function, and we are not contributing to the unity and the strength of the body. That's just the plain and simple truth. And so the equipping and the building up, if you look at these verses is to continue, as Paul says, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. He says in verse 14 that the result is, is that you're no longer children. In verse 15, he says we're to grow up in all aspects into him. And in verse 16, he says, he tells us that all of the in individual parts, when all of us, all of the little different pieces, all of the different functions, when, when, we're, when we're doing all of that, we're fulfilling our role, it causes the growth of the body. And so, friends, the goal is unity and knowledge and maturity. We're to strive for maturity according to the full measure of the fullness of Christ. Christ is our aim. He is our standard. That's what we should be focused on. And we need each other. We need each other. And we come together so that we can grow up in Christ. And so, looking at what Paul says here, I think that we see the purpose and the need for assembling together and with our brothers and sisters. We see the need for uh, worshiping together. We, we, when we study together, when we, when we get together outside of the walls of this building, when we... Uh, when we serve others together, all of these things, I think we, we see what Paul's saying. These are opportunities that we should look forward to because we can come together wherever it is to encourage one another. We can discuss the scriptures together. We can help each other grow in our faith. Verse 15 tells us the catalyst for this growth, and that is to speak the truth in love. And we do that when we're together. We speak the truth and love to each other so that we can grow again in Christ. God wants us to grow. We're to grow in faith and knowledge and maturity so the entire body of Christ can be united. The fullness of Christ is our growth target. And Paul tells us in verse 14 that if every single person fulfills their function, it's going to produce the desired results. The results are going to be that, hey, we're not going to be children anymore. We're no longer going to be immature spiritually because remaining immature is going to cause a lot of problems, and so that's the idea there. If, if, we, if we don't grow, we remain like a child, then, then what's going to happen? We're going to be tricked. We're going to be tricked. We're going to be deceived by Satan. We're going to be deceived by others. We're, uh, we're going to be tossed around in our life uh, like waves just battering against your body, just tossed to and fro, as it says here in these verses. 
Every single quote-unquote new teaching that comes along is going to trick you. It's going to knock you down like a strong wind. You'll be easily deceived by the schemes of Satan and others. And so, if we do what Paul is describing here, then we'll move beyond that. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit, Paul said. The unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God and maturity in Christ, friends, that will stabilize you. That will stabilize your faith and your life, and you'll no longer be the children that's being talked about. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever, ever find yourself sometimes feeling unstable in life spiritually? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever... Um, things feel sometimes difficult in your life I think God is telling us why it could be could be I'm not saying it's definitely that but it could be we're not growing as we should could be that our faith is not what it ought to be it could be that we're not really increasing in knowledge as we should and moving towards maturity to use Paul's words from verse 1 we're not walking worthy of our calling not walking according to the purpose that God has given us. And Satan is going to throw you around. He's going to beat you up, and he's going to batter you like the waves of the ocean. But when we all do our part, and this is where we want to focus, right? When we all do our part, when we fulfill our roles, and we perform our functions in the body, just like verse 16 says. Notice verse 16. Being fitted together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. When we do this, it causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And we need to understand that every single one of us is in that passage. And all of us have a role. Now, before we wrap this up, Please, please do not walk out of here thinking that I'm encouraging you to complete some checklist because that is absolutely not what I'm saying. So if I came across that way, then let's talk about it because that's not what I'm talking about. By no means am I suggesting you, know, you know, come to every service and participate in every activity and serve in a variety of ways and all this just because that's what's expected of you. That's not, that's not the idea. What I'm saying is, is that we all need to understand the impact that we have on each other. And we need to develop a desire to do these things because it helps us become that mature person that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 4. And we understand that it contributes to the strength and the unity of the body. That's the point. This family. We need to realize how much we as individuals affect the body, one way or the other. One way or the other, we do. We're a family. I'm going to keep saying that because I'm going to reemphasize what Paul said this morning. We're a family. We're all a part of this family, and we all contribute somehow, some way. So that brings us to this. So I said all of that to get to this point, right? <laughs> Large introduction, quick point. Complacency. I said at the beginning that we need to appreciate what we have and that we need to build upon what we have and we need to guard it. We have to guard against complacency. Complacency is defined as a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, a smug satisfaction with an existing condition, and oftentimes, unaware of potential danger. That's complacency. And one, one, when, when somebody has grown spiritually complacent, what does that look like? They look like boredom. They look like mundaneness and just a lack of interest or a lack of excitement or maybe just be very dull. It could be a lack of enthusiasm 
um, lack of energy, a, a look of just being at ease all of the time, that's kind of what it looks like. And what's the results? What's the results of complacency? Well, no, no growth in the church. Maybe have some members that start backsliding a little bit, kind of get lost in the shadows. Um, sometimes it may even become a hindrance to converting souls. And so, to be clear, we're not saying that this is a major problem here in Kaysville. That is not our point at all. Uh, not at all. So let's be clear about that. Because we feel like the work is very strong here. And we feel like, again, God has blessed us. We're thriving. Good things are happening. But at the same time, the reason we're talking about these things today is because we need to be realistic. And there is always room for improvement. There's always things that we can do better. And this is... Uh, th there's, there, there's certainly room for us to be alert and to be aware and to protect what we have right now because the truth of the matter is is that the more that we thrive here the more the stronger this church is the stronger this body is here we're a bigger target for Satan mark my word and so it's going to take diligence on our part we've got to work to protect it 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 says Art, <laughs> therefore let him think uh, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Look around you tonight. Look around you tonight. I, 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 would, I would encourage you to do this. Look around you tonight, and I want you to think about uh, um, some folks that, that maybe aren't here. And, and again, we, uh, to Paul's point this morning, not, there's always there's, there's situations that don't allow people to be here. But look, look around. There, there might be some that are not here in our audience tonight that maybe might need some encouragement. Maybe. But again, we're a family. Let's reach out to them. Let's ask. There might be, uh, might be some that might need some admonishing like Paul talked about this morning. So let's be a family. Let's be a family. Let's strengthen this body. Let's reach out to them. Let's be diligent, as Paul says. Let's be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit here in this place. So in conclusion, let me say this. Why did I think this passage is applicable to us right now? I, I said that in the beginning. I told you I would come back and explain why. So really quick, let me say. Because things are going so well here, again, as we've kind of already stated, the danger is, is that we might get a little comfortable. The danger is we might get a little comfortable, we might get a little lazy, and we might get a little complacent. We might fall into the trap that, hey, you know what? Everything's okay. Everything's going well. We'll just continue this way without a whole lot of effort from anyone. And if we're in that mindset and we think, well, somebody else is going to do it or whatever, so I don't have to. And the danger is, is that what if everybody else had that exact same point of view? Then things won't get done. I think this is applicable because now Kyle has announced, of course, that he's leaving. Perhaps some might be, maybe even a little nervous about the work here in Kaysville. I don't know. Um, but we need to realize how significant your role is and how significant your role has been in the growth that has taken place here. We're going to miss Kyle tremendously. I'm sure he's going to listen to this later. So, Kyle, yes, we are going to miss you tremendously. <laughs> it goes without saying. I, I've, I've shed many tears about this very thing over the past few weeks. We're going to miss him a lot. But Kyle will be the first one to admit that his portion of this growth has been just that, a portion his part he's played his part and so with Kyle's announcement there, there, there's going to be as we said this morning there's going to be an interim period of time to where uh, we're, we're not going to have a full-time preacher perhaps we don't know how long that's going to be we don't know I, we have no idea at this point but it's important for every single one of us to make a concerted effort to do our part for the body here in Kaysville and again we just thought it would be a good time to remind ourselves of these things. As Paul said this morning, it might be a good time to perhaps reevaluate, I think you said, reevaluate our commitment to, to the work here at Kaysville. 
And so my, my words to you tonight are, look at this passage, Ephesians chapter 4. Take a look at it. Not just what I say tonight, but go home, look at it. Think about it. Take this passage to heart and realize all, all of us are part in this work here. Don't get complacent. Don't get lazy. Don't get lost in the larger membership here and kind of get lost in the shadows and choose not to be active. Don't get overly comfortable in our situation. The more, again, the more we're thriving, the bigger target we are for Satan. But as, as fast as this work has grown, this is the last statement I want to say. As fast as this has grown over the past few years and as this has picked up momentum, understand that it can come to a screeching halt just as quick if we all don't do our part. That's my message. Perhaps your condition tonight is that you're ready to make the first step and you realize that, you know what, it's time to make a commitment. It's time for me to start working for the cause of Christ. And if you desire to be baptized tonight, then, hey, we are here eagerly awaiting to help you if that's the case. But I suspect that the majority of the people here, as we think about an invitation, the majority of the folks here, maybe we just, as we've been talking about today in, in our, our early sermon, in this sermon, in our congregational meeting, maybe... Maybe you realize that um, maybe I've been slacking a little bit in my personal growth. Maybe I haven't been as active as I need to be. Maybe um, I've let the body down by not fulfilling my function and my role, and I haven't taken that seriously. And if that's the case, then I would just say to you, let's handle it exactly the way God intended for that to be handled, and let us know, let us support you, let us, let us pray for you, let us encourage you, because why? Because that's what a family is supposed to do. That's what a family is supposed to do. Let's stand up and sing.